Okay, so great pleasure to welcome Jonathan Epstein from McDaniel College, who will speak on symmetry groups of solved manifolds. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to just thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, even though it's not in person, it's nice to be part of a sort of a, a global a global community like this. Um, so uh, I, before I begin, um, the way that my technology setup is you'll have to just be able to watch what I write and, and listen to the, a disembodied voice for, for most of the talk. Um, I apologize for that. But um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video for now. Um, okay, so um, first, all of this is joint work with uh, um, Mike Dobonsky. So let me just write that down. At the University of Oklahoma. Um, so much of what I'm going to talk about today was inspired by, uh, by the notion of a maximally symmetric metrics on, uh, on a Lie group. So I'm just going to start by recalling that definition. So a left invariant metric on a Lie group. on a Lie group, uh, let's call the metric little g on a Lie group big G uh, is called maximally symmetric uh, if for any other left invariant Lie, uh, metric, let's call it H, Um, there exists some automorphism psi of the Lie group G um, such that the isometry group of H is contained inside the pullback of the isometry group or the isometry group of the pullback of G. Um, okay, so uh, so in a certain sense, we're saying that uh, that uh, a maximally symmetric metric um, has as a very large isometry group um, in a specific way. So some examples of Lie groups that um, that admit maximally symmetric metrics. Include the following. Um, so, to start with, uh, if the Lie group G is compact and simple, uh, we can show that it does. Uh, if the Lie group is uh, semi simple of non compact type, And it also does. Uh, and another another class would be uh, simply connected, completely solvable. Uh, unimodular Lie groups. Right. And so this class would include uh, simply connected, no potent. Lee groups. Okay, so that's a whole bunch that do. Um, some examples that don't 
uh, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, so in the case of G compact and simple, uh, what's the metric? Is the killing? Um, yeah, it'll it'll need to be bi-invariant. Okay. And what about this notion on, on the homogeneous space? Is has been oh. studied? Not that I'm aware of, but that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. No, I was wondering if, if on, on a G over K with G compact, mm -hmm. the standard metric is, is maximally symmetric or not. But okay, so it's, it's not studied yet? I don't think so. I'm not aware of it. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so some examples that don't, it wouldn't be very interesting if there's not that side of things. Um, some, so some compact semi-simple. And another example, and this one's very specific, is uh, if S1 is the Iwasawa subgroup of SL2R. Um, so this, another way to say that it's the unique, uh, connected, simply connected, non-abelian, two-dimensional solvable Lie group. And we take uh, the, actual, the actual group now to be uh, S1 cross a factor of R. So this group does not admit a metric of maximal symmetry. Okay, so sort of the goal that um, that we had in mind at the start of this was to understand the existence of maximally symmetric metrics of maximally symmetric metrics um, on for, for the class of Lie groups consisting of simply connected, completely solvable ones. Okay, so this is, this is a nice class uh, to work with. Um, it's, it's uh, hopefully tractable enough to make some progress, but it's also complicated enough to include examples that are both, both admit maximally symmetric metrics and, and that don't. In particular, right, we could take, uh, these guys are um, gonna be completely solvable and simply connected, but they, they, uh, don't, uh, they do admit maximally symmetric metrics, but here's an example of a, of one that does not, but it is also simply connected and completely solvable. So we would like to just sort of tease apart and see if there's any kind of structure going on here. Okay, so uh, to start with, uh, I just wanna note that um, sort of thinking about uh, this example S, the last one that I introduced, uh, so an important part of showing, maybe I'll just raise. So part part of showing that S does not. Maybe I'll be more specific. So S being the same example from above does not admit such metrics. is um, in particular the existence of a metric, say H, um, such that the, um, the isometry group G, or at least the connected component of the identity has a levy decomposition 
uh, G1 semi-direct G2. Um, and um, Uh, and we have that uh, simply transitive subgroup of G, uh, which we can identify with S sitting inside of G, um, has the following, um, induces a decomposition on S. Ooh. Okay, sorry, bad notation here. Um, actually, that's fine. So it induces a decomposition of S in the following way. Uh, and, and in particular, S1 is, and I guess this is kind of the important part, the Iwasawa subgroup of, of that semi-simple factor in the Levy decomposition. So this, this, I'm not really explaining why, but this seemed to be an important part of that proof. Uh, so I mentioned it to motivate the, the next definition um, of what we call a pre-levy decomposition. So the definition. Uh, Jonathan, could you remind us what completely solvable means? Because I think it's key here. Okay, yeah, just that... Um, if you look at the Lie algebra of S, uh, all the eigenvalues of, um, yeah, are gonna be real. So maybe I'll make a note of that. So S being the Lie algebra of the Lie group S, um, we have that um, the spectrum of add X is contained in R. And then we say that this, the Lie group is completely solvable if the Lie algebra is. Okay. Um, Right, so a uh, definition that uh, I'm gonna introduce now is that of a pre-levy decomposition. So a decomposition of a solvable Lie algebra into a semi-direct product is called pre-levy. if um, sort of two things hold. So the first one is that uh, the factor S1 is the uh, isomorphic to the Iwasawa uh, subalgebra of some semi-simple uh, Lie algebra G1. Okay, so that's sort of abstracting uh, half, of, half of what's going on in that example. And then the other thing that needs to happen is that um, I'm just going to give a name to the, uh, the map here that we're... So uh, I'm calling rho uh, the, um, the action of S1 on S2 by derivations. So, so rho here needs to be the restriction of some, some representation of G1 on S2. Okay, so maybe with these two ingredients, we're able to kind of take that example and, and build it out in reverse, starting with the solvable uh, Lie algebra S. Uh, 
Okay. So what we would like to say is once we have this definition in place is What we would like to say is that uh, if uh, if s equals um, s one semi-direct s two is pre-levy, then we want to be able to realize it as a subalgebra of G one semi-direct s two. Um, but the, the kind of issue is that in the definition, we're saying only that this needs to be a representation of G1 on S2, not necessarily an action by derivations. Uh, but it turns out that that's not needed. So um, let me explain why, why that's true. So. Right, so what I'm saying here, I guess, is what we really need is that row of G1 is actually sitting inside the derivations of S2 and not just the linear transformations of S2. But in fact, it's enough to know that um, the Iwasawa subalgebra S2 acts by derivations to know that, that this is actually guaranteed. Okay, so a lemma. The lemma is just that. So this uh, extension by representation is contained in the derivations of S2. All right, so I'm gonna sketch a little bit of the proof. And it starts by considering uh, the vector space, uh, the second exterior power of uh, S2 dual um, tensored with S2. So. If you're not familiar with this object, um, right, these are alternating bilinear maps on S2 that take values in S2. Um, and in particular, uh, if that map turns out to satisfy the Jacobi identity, it would, it would give a, a Lie bracket structure on S2. And uh, just some more notation, let G1 be the decomposition or a, a levy, an Iwasawa decomposition, a K1 S1 be a levy decomposer, sorry, Iwasawa decomposition. Um, and just one more piece of notation is to let G, uh, capital G1 K1 and S1 be the corresponding uh, connected Lie subgroups uh, of GL, capital GL, S2. And I guess I'm not spelling out maybe all the details, but uh, thinking of the image of G1 in there, of S2 there. Um, okay, so then uh, an element of capital GL S2 will act on uh, V by the following formula. So if mu is one of these alternating bilinear maps, then G acting on mu applied to two vectors is given by the formula. Like this. And then um, this action, I guess it's, it's important to note that uh, if G is an automorphism of S2, uh, in fact, if and only if, uh, it fixes mu, where um, U is the Lie bracket structure on S2. 
Okay, so then um, at this point, I'm going to appeal to uh, a sub lemma due to um, Mike Jablonski. Uh, where, uh, so I'll just write it out. So G is uh, a connected, simply connected connected, simply connected, a uh, semi-simple Lie group of non-compact type. Uh, and we have some representation of that Lie group on a vector space, V. Um, so then the conclusion is that if Um, if G fix, uh, if the orbit of some vector X is compact, uh, then, uh, then in fact, the orbit is a single element. Okay. So, um, so now this sublemma essentially just gives the result. So the only thing to note is that um, S1, because the Lie algebra S1 acts by derivations, S1, the connected Lie subgroup of capital GLS2, will act by automorphisms of S2. So uh, if we take the action of all of G1, on mu, this would be the same as K1 S1 acting on mu, but we know all of S1 fixes mu. So we have a compact group K1 acting on mu and uh, the result follows. In fact, all of G1 has to fix mu. Uh, so, so that's nice. And, uh, in our definition of a pre-levy decomposition, we we don't need to worry about whether uh, sort of the extension of rho is an action by derivations or not. It's sort of automatically guaranteed. So a piece of terminology that I'll, I'll introduce is now that we know we can form the algebra G1 semi-direct S2, um, we'll call it an extension an extension of of s. And if I want to be specific about an extension by uh, a certain type of non-compact semi-simple g one, I'll say I'll specify by saying by g one. Okay, um, so a justification for this notion of pre-levy decomposition uh, is the following proposition, is that if, if S does not, is a completely solvable Lie algebra, Uh, and it does not admit um, a semi-simple extension. Uh, then S admits a metric of maximum symmetry. So at least there, there is a connection between the notion of pre-levy decomposition or, 
or equivalently an extension of S uh, and in maximal symmetry. And the, I'm just going to give maybe the idea of the proof here is that uh, for, for any left invariant metric H, uh, the isometry algebra or the isometry group will have a, a particular form. Um, It'll have the form uh, uh, L semi-direct S, um, where where L is, is a subgroup of the automorphisms of S and uh, is compact. And then the idea is uh, so. Um, L will sit inside some, some maximal compact subgroup of, of automorphisms of S, and these are all going to be conjugate. So, if so, turning this proposition around, if we want to know, uh, um, we want to know whether uh, S extends or not, uh, we would like maybe a procedure for, for, um, for, for knowing if, if an extension, yeah, a procedure just to, to know intrinsically from the data given by S whether such a pre levy decomposition exists or, or such an extension equivalently. Okay. Um, the first step, maybe, in simplifying that problem is. Uh, Maybe I'll note that I'm changing gears a little bit. Um, so how to detect extensions of S. Okay, so the proposition is that we can actually uh, change the question or, or uh, simplify the question a little bit where we only need to look for extensions that are of ra real rank one Lie algebras. So, so, if, so if S extends, uh, by some, some semi-simple G one of any rank, then it'll extend uh, by some rank one, Lie algebra H maybe. Okay, so if we can show there's no rank one extensions, then we would know there's no extensions at all in, and it'll admit a metric of maximal symmetry. Um, so I guess I'll say a couple words on, on why this is true. Uh, so we can just assume for simplicity uh, that S is the Iwasawa subalgebra of some G1. And um, you'll recall that, uh, that uh, that we have some uh, Iwasawa decomposition of G1. And the way that this Iwa, Iwasawa decomposition is built um, is by taking, uh, by looking at the action of A, which is A1, which is some maximal abelian subspace of, of the part of the Carton decomposition P, um, but it'll decompose uh, 
the algebra G1 into a bunch of restricted root spaces. And these uh, restricted roots are an abstract root system. So let me summarize some of that. Yeah, I guess I'll just use the notation G1 as a Carton decomposition K1, P1. And then we take uh, A1 inside of P1 as a maximal abelian. Um, these will be simultaneously diagonalizable. Uh, so we get a bunch of restricted roots. which I'll denote by capital sigma. So these are sitting in the dual to A1. And since, uh, since these uh, restricted roots form an abstract root system, we can certainly create uh, a notion of positivity uh, or um, choose a vial chamber equivalently and, and write down a system of simple roots. Um, right, so let's call capital Pi uh, this collection of roots, say L of them, uh, sitting inside the positive roots, which will be sitting inside um, all of the restricted roots. Um, okay, so I, I think I have the notation that I need. Um, and we need a little lemma, I suppose. Where, okay, first I'll show you how to build it. So take, so uh, G1 alpha will be the, oh. Well, Okay, so let G1 alpha be the restricted root space of any restricted root alpha. Um, and uh, we know that, so S is built as um, the maximal abelian plus we're gonna take the direct sum of the positive restricted roots. Um, and so now to extract to, to we're gonna build the uh, real rank one, and then everything left over will be shown to be invariant under its action. And then that will give us the, de the real rank one decomposition that we're looking for. So, yeah. So we let H1 be uh, the subalgebra. generated by, and we can choose any simple root we want to. Um, so let's just take alpha one and it's negative. And uh, that will be a real rank one subalgebra. And then the last thing we need to know is just, well, uh, all the remaining restricted root spaces are left invariant by H1. And that's another sort of sublemma to show. That if we take the direct sum of all the positive restricted roots except alpha one and possibly two alpha one if it's not a reduced system. This will be invariant under H1. Okay, so that allows us to, to form um, 
a rank one extension. If we sort of define the pieces as um, yeah. Uh, So now we have this extension uh, H1 semi direct, sort of an S1 prime uh, semi direct S2. Um, so this was our old S1 that we started with in parentheses. Okay. So that's just a little an idea of, of what goes into showing that we only need to consider rank one extensions. Okay. Um, so trying to see what to focus on towards the end here. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip over a couple of things. Uh, so first, uh, so I'm going to assume from now on that so so our completely solvable uh, semi -sim uh, sorry completely solvable Lie algebra S uh, can be decomposed as uh, A cross N where uh, this is abelian, and this is the no radical. Of S and furthermore we're going to I'm going to assume. That the new radical is two step. Okay, so that's going to be my standing assumption for the for the remainder of the talk. Uh, so uh, some examples of such Lie algebras. I'm going to give you three of them, and they're going to be sort of prototypes. The first one would be S could be the Iwasawa of some G1. And uh, I'm also assuming that all of my extensions are now by rank ones. Oh, that, sorry, that's not true. Um, in any case, where G1 is simple. And uh, another way we could form such algebras would be uh, as sort of representations. So here, um, Rn is just uh, an abelian Lie algebra and S1 acts on it by rho. And we're going to assume that S1 is the Iwasawa of of some G1 with G1 simple. Uh, and, and lastly, we could have some, some S, which is A prime semi direct N prime, which does not admit an extension. Okay, so, so sort of these are three three things that can happen and uh one thing that we know is uh so maybe i'll make this a claim is that every completely solvable uh s with two step no radical Uh, 
uh, can be decomposed as a, as a sum. Uh, and so it's going to have a bunch of factors, which I call I1 through Ia. And then an A prime semi direct. And then a bunch of factors of, called R1 through Rb. And then a factor N prime. And what, what I mean by these is that these are all going to be of type uh, type one, the I being for Iwasawa. And these are all going to be of type uh, two, the R being for representation. Uh, so we know that we can decompose uh, S in this way. Um, which is nice because there's kind of just three three things to think about. Um, but uh, we're still working on the issue of uniqueness. But given the restriction on the step size, um, I, we're thinking that there should be still some structure that can be teased out of this. Um, and so I just want to bring up sort of two subtleties to the uniqueness question. Excuse me, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, this semi-direct product, are all the factors acting on it or just the A prime? I mean, um, acting possibly non-trivially or? Uh, yes. Okay. They could act non-trivially. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so, so two, yeah, and, and if you want me to scroll back up at any point, um, please let me know. Uh, so two subtleties to the uniqueness question uh, are, uh, well, I'll illustrate the first one with an example. Um, suppose that, uh, yeah, suppose that we take uh, S1 cross row R2, um, where uh, rho, so S1 is going to be the Iwasawa of SL2R, and rho is the restriction of the standard representation on, on R2. Uh, then there, there seems to be two ways, two things we could do with this. So on the one hand, by, you know, sort of by design, we can extend it to SL2R semi-direct R2. And on the other hand, we could extend it uh, to SL3R. And, um, it's pretty easy to see where that extension is coming from, just thinking in terms of block matrices. Uh, we would have a copy of SL2R sitting here and a copy of R2 here, but all of this, of course, is sitting inside of uh, SL3R. Um, so that would be one source of non-uniqueness. There's two ways to extend the representation type. Um, and uh, another is has to do with, um, yeah, again, uh, the roles that the various root and weight spaces play. So for example, um, just because of the restriction on the step size, we can think of a representation type as an A1 semi-direct N1. So that's the Iwasawa. Um, and it's acting on so the representation space can only have two weight spaces because 
if there were any more weight spaces, then the no radical would have um, too large of its step size. So these have to be alpha over two, uh, a, direct, a direct sum of alpha over two and negative alpha over two. And uh, the and the um, the issue here is is that when the three spaces n one v alpha over two and v negative alpha over two uh, have the same dimension. Uh, then the role that uh, basically the roles of n1 and v negative alpha over 2 can be swapped. Um, so, uh, so in order to uh, tackle these problems, we kind of thought that well, there should be it should be pretty restrictive what type of representation or which representations can appear and which uh, rank ones and so on. And so uh, that started us looking at the real representation theory of uh, real rank one semi simple Lie or simple Lie algebras. I'm just gonna look at the representation theory of real rank ones. Okay, um, so the general, it seems to me that the general idea usually is to take your, your real object when you're talking about semi-simple Lie algebras and you complexify it and then use the robust theory of complex semi-simple Lie algebras um, to understand what's going on. And then you trace back through the real forms uh, to, see, to see what happens in the real setting. Um, and so oftentimes this leads to uh, very parallel theories, but sometimes it leads to sort of exceptional cases that are somewhat surprising. Um, and so the two questions we, we had that started us out were, um, so question one is just what are the highest, highest restricted weights that can appear uh, as representations of real rank ones? Right, so, uh, or yeah, I guess, in, Okay, so maybe I'm just gonna focus on one of these questions given time. So the question that I'm gonna focus on has to do with the second subtlety uh, above. Uh, so the question is, for which real rank one uh, simple Lie algebras Is there a representation uh, V with only two restricted weight spaces? Uh, 
Uh, and if this happens, um, which ones satisfy the dimensional requirement that the dimension of the representation space is exactly twice the dimension of the N in the Iwasawa decomposition of the real rank one simple. Okay, so uh, we were able to actually compute a list that answers this question. And um, what was kind of surprising to us is that uh, we needed the, the, full, um, the full theory related to the real setting. We couldn't just parallel the complex one. So maybe I'll say after I write down the theorem, uh, I'll say a word about that. So the answer to the question is that there's sort of four And their G, uh, G equals SL2R is one of them. And V is the standard representation. Uh, SL2C is another. And again, um, V is the standard representation uh, viewed as a real object. Uh, and there's two more. So one is SL2H. And the last one is SO91. And in each case, uh, V is, uh, is one of two, two irreducible representations. So, um, so that's that's the list. So in our in our decomposition above, if we're worried about how to extend in that situation where all the dimensions are perfectly aligned, this is the complete list of ways that could happen. Uh, and I guess uh, I'm going to leave a couple minutes for questions. But the last thing I want to say is, um, although the two representations in in the last two cases. So the representations are, are not isomorphic, um, but if we allow precomposition with an outer automorphism, uh, they, they are isomorphic in that way. Okay, so I think that's, that's where I intended to get to today. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, are there questions? I have a I have a question. This is Megan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Megan. I, I, okay. Could you say a little bit about that? How that example four is rank one? Um, or what's the rank one there? Oh, I mean, so it'll be real rank one. Um, yeah, it just uh, it. So you can think of it as as. Um, 10 by 10 block matrices with, or sorry, 10 by 10 matrices with entries in C. Uh, and then uh, the way that you could build uh, 
and, and then there's some conditions on, on the blocking those matrices. And then the way you would build, for example, the uh, Carton decomposition, you would get sort of just, I mean, it's, it's uh, okay. Maybe I'll, I'll try to answer with a picture. So you would take uh, block matrices like these with nine entries and one. Um, and uh, the entries in, in the, this part give you uh, the P in the, uh, Carton, in the Carton decomposition. So when you take a maximal abelian subspace of that, uh, one, one way to do it would just be to have a non-zero entry here and here. And that would be the one, the one dimensional uh, uh, subspace of P that would, yeah. So, and then you can't make it any bigger. Uh, so that would be showing as rank one, I suppose. I don't know if that answers your question quite, but, but that's how I think of it. Are there other questions? Uh, thank you. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Good question. I have a question. Have um, I don't know if you um, thought yet, or maybe something you're you're planning to think about, uh, whether um, when you have an extension, is there a maximal one uh, where the G one is contains all other possible extensions? Um, I think we've. We thought about it a little bit, but we were kind of um, trying to restrict ourselves to, to the, the rank one extensions um, for simplicity and, and sort of this example. So the short answer is no, we haven't really thought about it uh, deeply at least, um, but sort of this example here showing that you, you might have some kind of maybe like Galois correspondence going on with, uh, with sub algebras, um, but but yeah, I'm just not sure in general. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions, sir? If not, uh, thank you again. Um, I'll stop the recording. Okay. Thank you very much. It was good. <laughs>